here's George Oppen. Uh, I hope everyone knows who George Oppen was, American poet, 1908 to 1984. Um, early poet in his early 20s, part of the objectivist group pub and a publisher of Williams, Pounds, Zukovsky, and others. Um, quit writing poetry uh, when he and his wife Mary returned from France in the very early 30s. They became communists and organizers. Um, fought in World War II, nearly killed from battle wounds. Um, and then in the early 50s, because of his communist connections, absconded with his wife and daughter to Mexico, where he lived for eight years. And then, 58, George started writing again. And all his great work is from that period, 58 to around 72. But for me, one of the great poets, and he was my friend. And so the letter I'm about to read was written on October 24th, 1984 and was never sent. I found it a few months ago in a box of old unpublished writings, and since it concerns George Oppen, the poet I was asked to talk about today, I've decided to read it to you rather than give a formal presentation of Oppen's work. It is addressed to someone named Michael, who had asked me to write something about Oppen in the weeks or months that followed his death. I can think of three possible Michaels who might have done that, but I can no longer remember which one it was. It is unclear to me why I failed to send the letter, but I suspect it was because I felt my words were inadequate. Well, this letter is about 10 pages long, so I'm not gonna read all of it, but just some of it. So here we are, Brooklyn, October 24th, 1984. Dear Michael, <clears throat> Since your telephone call two months ago, I've been trying to put something down on paper about George's work, but I can't seem to get anywhere with it. His death is too new to me, I think, and it keeps getting in the way. God knows that the work is important to me, as important as any American poetry I have read, but it is there after all and will continue to be there no matter what I say. It doesn't need George in order to survive. Once it was written, it never did. Still, it is important for you to know that I carry his poems inside me. <clears throat> and again and again over many years, small, unforgettable lines and phrases have continued to come surging up into my consciousness, just like that, for no reason that I am aware of, suddenly washing through me with their intense and simple beauty, speaking out in me, I suppose, for the simple reason that they are unforgettable. For example, like a flat sea, here is where we are, the empty reaches, empty of ourselves. For example, the family cars in the dim sound of the living, the noise of increase to which we owe what we possess. We cannot reconcile ourselves. No one is reconciled, though we spring from the ground together. For example, ultimately the air is bare sunlight where must be found the lyric valuables. For example, Sarah, little seed, little violent, diligent seed. Come, let us look at the world glittering. This seed will speak, Max, words. There will be no other words in the world, but those our children speak. For example, what do we believe to live with? Answer, not invent, just answer all that first attempts. For example, the planet's time, blood from a stone, life from a stone dead dam, mother nature, because we find the others deserted like ourselves and therefore brothers. There's a cell phone clicking away, singing. Turn it off, please. Okay. I can't compete with Calypso music. 
Uh, and then the last one, for example, impossible to doubt the world. It can be seen, and because it is irrevocable, it cannot be understood. And I believe that fact is lethal. The most I can do right now is offer a few memories. It's not that my friendship with George was an intimate one, but it was not a casual friendship either. And I saw him often enough and received enough letters from him to have formed some sense of who he was. Okay, now I'm going to skip ahead, cutting out our early letters to each other. We did not meet until the spring of 1976. And what stands out most from the encounter are small details, minuscule fragments. Why these things should seem important is a mystery to me, but they have stuck somewhere in my brain. And whenever I think of George, these are the memories that come back first. <clears throat> How, for example, when I walked him to his house on Polk Street, this is in San Francisco, for the first time, he was standing in the kitchen washing dishes, decked out in a pair of pink rubber gloves and up to his elbows in suds. Hardly the posture of a venerable poet out to impress a young admirer, but George never played those games with anyone. Later that day, or perhaps it was another day soon afterwards, we all went out for a walk, and, it was a, and as it was a raw, chilly afternoon, and George did not have a proper coat, he grabbed the first one that came to hand, which happened to belong to his niece, Andy, a very ladylike coat with a fur collar and elaborate fur cuffs. George put it on without the slightest hesitation, to add to the absurdity, it was far too small for him, and then walked outside with the rest of us. The thing that impressed me most was that he didn't say a word about it. Another man would have been embarrassed and would have made some joke to cover up his embarrassment. But not only did George say nothing, he did not even seem to notice. A small incident to be sure, but at the same time it reveals something essential about George. His lack of self-consciousness, his utter indifference to appearances, and when I speak of appearances, I am not just referring to clothes. Okay, skipping, skipping. All kinds of incidents, but coming to the end. Later still, in 1980, I concocted a plan to interview George for the Paris Review. I was looking for an excuse to see him again, and it also seemed like a good way to give his poetry some attention in a different sphere to introduce his work to a new group of readers. The Paris Review accepted the idea quite willingly, and when I wrote to George with a proposal, he answered as follows. And I should add that George was suffering from early Alzheimer's at this point. Dear Paul, very tempting. A pleasant project to see you again and to talk. What worries me is the question of whether or not I can say anything that I have not already said. And my own condition at this moment, which is something, alas, very like senility. I am not being very brilliant these days, and I have not written anything since primitive. It is not that I fear being less than brilliant. I find that my only recourse is to admit to myself and to others that on familiar streets, I cannot find my way home. I'm not attempting to deny this fact, but alas, how the mighty mites have fallen. It would nevertheless be a great pleasure to me and to Mary to talk. I'll do my best if you go ahead. <clears throat> I did go ahead and in February of 1981, I flew out to San Francisco. George and Mary met me at the airport and I spent the next few days at their house. The sequence of events is obscure to me now. I remember drinking champagne one night at dinner. I remember several walks and sitting on a bench with George at one point as Mary accompanied their little dog to the end of the pier. There was also the morning we all went to the YMHA. <clears throat> the doctor had recommended exercise for George and Mary enjoyed swimming in the pool. This was their routine and there was no reason to disrupt it on my account. At the Y, Mary went off to the women's locker room and George and I headed for the men's. Except for the sneakers he had put on for the occasion, he was wearing his normal clothes, a sweater with buttons, a shirt open at the collar, comfortable pants. And so I assumed that he was planning to change 
into gym gear of some kind or other. Why else would he have led me to the locker room? George came to a locker, stopped, and opened the door. Instead of the pile of equipment I was expecting to see inside, the locker was empty. George then removed his pipe from his pocket, placed it gently on the shelf, and closed the door. Okay, he said, let's go. That was the extent of it. The locker was for his pipe, for his pipe and nothing else. It was a cheap corncob pipe, the kind of pipe that used to be displayed on the counter of every candy store and tobacco shop across America, the people's pipe, which sold for a dollar or two, roughly fashioned, inelegant, but serviceable. George and his pipe always traveled together, except when he started in his locker to do his thrice weekly exercises which were unnecessary, by the way, or at least useless, since George was in excellent physical condition. And even in his late 60s and early 70s, he was lean and erect, strong, with the bearing of a young man. The mind that was going could not be saved by tossing around a medicine ball. During that visit in 1980, however, he was much better than I thought he would be. There were times when he had to grope for his words, but there were also some moments of blazing wit, spontaneous remarks as precise and funny as anything I'd ever heard him say. If the interview was not a success, George was not to blame for it. The problem was my own ineptitude. I had drawn up a list of questions in advance, but once the tape recorder started turning, I was gripped by a sense of how stupid these questions were. My voice trembled. I had trouble getting the words out of my mouth. The three of us sat around the kitchen table for a number of hours, three or four, I think, spaced out over several sessions, and George and Mary both did their best. But because I knew them and cared about them, because I was involved with them in ways that went beyond poetry, I could never strike the proper interviewer's pose. You need detachment for that and a certain hard-heartedness to pursue difficult questions, and I just didn't have it in me. The results were therefore inadequate. A repetition of comments George had made to other interviewers in the past and descriptions of events that Mary had already covered in her autobiography. It pains me to think about it now, not because I failed, but because it was a bad idea to begin with. The fact that this was the last time I saw George only makes it worse. I listened to the tape only once, soon after returning to New York. I remember being startled by the sound of canaries chirping in the background. These were the birds that lived by the window in George and Mary's kitchen. And as we spoke that day, they'd been singing behind us. On the tape, the noise was so loud that you would think we had been talking in the middle of a forest. This tape has been sitting in a drawer of my desk for the past three and a half years. I do not have a tape recorder, but even if I did, I doubt that I would have the courage to listen to it again. On the bookshelf to the right of my desk, there is an etching that Mary did around the time of my last visit, a tiny work, no more than two and a half inches by two and a half inches. It is a picture of four little birds, and I keep it there as a kind of charm. Whenever I look up at it, I hear the canaries again. I hear them singing in my drawer, and little by little, the whole room fills with the sound of it. Thank you.